Dear students, I welcome you all to the presentation of design of RC footings 1. This is in continuation with the presentations made by my friends earlier to this presentation, the topic being design of RCC structural elements. Now let me give you a small background with respect to the RCC structural elements. The main components of this material as you understand is reinforced concrete. There are two basically materials that we have here, one is the concrete and the second one is steel. Concrete is the widely used construction material that we have. As you know, it is the largest material that is being consumed by humans for any construction activity. There are various reasons for this uh, purpose. As you know, concrete is made from locally available materials. All the materials that we are using to make concrete that is cement, fine aggregate called as sand, coarse aggregate called as jelly and water are locally available and hence it is very convenient for us to process this material. Now you need to understand that these are not the only materials that we can use to make concrete. IS 10262 that is the Indian standard code for concrete mix design allows us to use six other materials in addition to these four materials that is the material six materials being the first one is fly ash, the second is ground granulated blast furnace slag popularly known as GGBS, then we have the rice husk ash, then we have got the silica fume, then the metacoline and finally the super plasticizer. So these six additional ingredients are normally called as admixtures. Now we can use these admixtures one or more in combination with the four primary ingredients to modify the properties of the concrete so that we get a good product. Now apart from the economical aspect, concrete can be easily molded to any shape and size. Also, it is the most economical construction material that we can think of when compared to other materials. One more strong aspect that is in favor of concrete is its durability. Now, concrete in its initial stage is very delicate, but if you try to take care of it in the initial period, it will become a very strong material and it can be there under any environment and it can easily resist water. That means this product will not deteriorate in the presence of water. But concrete also has some disadvantages that is it is very weak in tension. That means it cannot take up tensile stresses, but as you know it is very strong in compression. Now to make good this particular deficiency we use the reinforcement. 
generally made of steel. Now, when you talk about this material, it has very high tensile characteristics. So, what we now do is we try to take the material concrete and put reinforcements at appropriate places so that whatever deficiency that we are talking about in concrete can be rectified. So, this is what basically you need to understand. Now, regarding grades of concrete and grades of steel, you have plenty to choose from, especially concrete starting from M20. You can just try to have strengths in multiples of 5. Similarly, in case of steel, there are many grades, but as per Indian standards and the normal usage, we try to stick to two grades of steel that is Fe 415 and Fe 500. Now, with this little background on the material that we are trying to use in this topic, okay, let us continue the discussion. As you know, we are talking about the design of RC footings. Now, the various topics I would like to deal in this particular topic are the first one introduction, which covers all necessary information that one should be aware to design a reinforced concrete footing. Followed with that, let us try to understand what are the typical loads that we can encounter on a footing and how we can handle these loads to design a footing. Now, whatever design that we are talking about would be based on the limit state method as specified by the Bureau of Indian Standards. Basic examples that we are trying to deal here are isolated rectangular footings which are subjected to axial loads and axial load subject and combination of axial load and uniaxial moment. So, these are the two main types of loads that we would be subjecting in this exercise and we would be trying to get ourselves familiar with respect to design okay, of footing under these loads. And finally, we will try to understand what is a pedestal and what are the guidelines given by the BIS to design this pedestal. Now, as you are trying to see a picture that is a typical building that we all see and if you just try to if I assume that you are all sitting in a lecture hall then that is again inside a building. Now, buildings are being designed for some kind of activity. So, when we say activity, it can be for residential purpose, it can be commercial purpose, it can be an industrial purpose, etcetera. So, depending upon the type of activity, there would be loads associated with that activity. Now, all of you are sitting on a floor and you can understand that the load passed on by the belongings that are kept on the floor and uh, the weight of all the students and the other persons over there would be finally transmitted onto the slabs or the slabs are the one that carries these basic loads. Now, if you imagine how exactly this load finally gets transmitted to other structural components, you can easily understand that the slabs are supported on beams. So, hence whatever loads that are applied on the slabs would be transferred to the beams. Anyway, the amount of loads carrying carried on the beams 
will depend on the location of the loads okay, on the slabs. Anyway, in some format, okay, the loads get transferred onto the beams. Now, these beams would be supported on columns. If you see each column, okay, there would be many beams coming and resting on that. So, you can understand that the loads from the beam would be transferred onto the column. I hope all of you know column is a vertical member which is basically under compression. Now, these loads from the column would finally, go to the footings. So, what is the footing? Footing is the part of the structure present at the bottom of a column. Now, the loads or the forces do not stop at footing. Finally, it has to be transferred onto the soil. So, you can easily understand how the forces flow from one structural component to another structural component. So, loads applied on the slabs will go onto the beams, from there it will go onto the columns, from there it will go to the footings and finally, it gets transferred to the mother earth that is soil. Now, what I have described is nothing but the vertical loads okay, applied inside the building, but there would be also lateral loads subjected on the building. So, which would be carried by the basically columns and finally, it also would be transferred to the soil through the footings. So, this is what you need to understand with respect to forces, flow of forces in the building. Now, look at this picture. Now, I am just trying to describe okay, a term called as superstructure. Now, here this word super is a relative word. Now, I think all of you are familiar with words like supersonic, subsonic, etcetera. Now, when I say supersonic, so what do you mean over there? That is the velocity with which an object is traveling okay, is much higher than that of the velocity of sound. When you say subsonic, so it is similar to that, but on the other side, the velocity of the object is lower than the velocity of the sound. Similarly, so we are we have terms like superstructure and substructure in this exercise. So, when you say superstructure, so the reference point is the ground level. Now, we just look at this picture. So, this is the ground level that we are trying to talk about on the screen that is the ground level. So, whatever structure you are trying to see above the ground level, we call it as the superstructure that is the one that is visible can be called as superstructure. The one that is not visible is called as the substructure. Now, you can clearly see I have reproduced the same picture that I have shown in the last slide. So, whatever part of the building you are now seeing is nothing but the superstructure. As you know, this is on, not the only part of this structure there are some portions of the structure which are within the ground level. So, we call those structures as substructures. So, you can understand that superstructure is that part of the structure which is above the ground level and substructure is that part of the structure which is below the ground level. Now, in continuation with the same slide the figure that we had in that particular slide. So, you can easily understand that. Now, whatever uh, portions of the structure below the ground level and the soil okay, which carries the load okay, can be called as the foundation system. The foundation system will include the substructure that is the part of the structure below the ground level and the soil mass. Okay, that is trying to 
transfer or, or try to take the pressure from the footing. So that you can call it as the foundation system. Now if you just see the difference between these two pictures. Now here we have a rock mass which is present at some distance below the ground level. So the forces from the superstructure will go to the substructure and from the substructure it gets transmitted to the rock through soil. Here soil is relatively good so this arrangement can be made. On the other hand if you just look at this picture so the soil you can assume that is not weak. So in this case we are trying to transfer the load through the footing to the rock directly. So when you say foundation system it can be just the footing or footing with the soil. So but in this discussion when we talk about footings okay so we are talking about only that part of the substructure okay that we are trying to consider in the design. So you can say footings are generally located below the ground level and are also referred as foundations. Now this is a picture showing a typical footing. This part is the column or it can be the pedestal and this is the slab okay the main part of the footing that we are talking about. Below this you have the soil mass. Now the various forces that we are talking about which act on the footing are the vertical load as you can clearly see marked by V the red one okay the load acting in the vertical direction. We can have the horizontal forces that is if I have a lateral force acting on the structure in terms of your wind loads etc. So it is called as H then we have the moment in case you have a fixed bottom that is columns are fixed at the base. So the columns also tend to transfer some amount of moment onto the slab. So you have the moment acting and finally there can also be some other forces. So to summarize regarding this slide, so we have the vertical force acting on the footing, you have the horizontal force acting on the footing, you have the bending moment acting on the footing moment at the base of the column. So generally these are the popular forces that we would be trying to consider in the design of footing. However, when we take up the design examples we would be restricting our discussions to only two forces that is the vertical force and the moment. However, footings can be designed to transfer any type of force which act on it. Now this is another slide showing you the pictures of various types of uh, structures that you can have in civil engineering. So as you can clearly see I am trying to show you different types of structures. So coming to our definition of foundations, so you can assume that all these structures will have a part of it below the ground level. So and hence for your structure to work well under any kind of environment or external loading. So these hidden portion of the structures should be designed properly. So if we just look at this picture again. So that is a superstructure part of the structure that is foundation and you have an infinite mass of soil which we also called as the ground. So again foundation is that part of the structure which is in direct contact with the soil. So as you, know, as you know this part is not in contact with the soil whereas this is in contact with the soil and is also hidden. Now the next part is we are trying to apply a lot of loads on this structure as I told you okay lot of dead weight okay we have got live loads and other kind of loads acting in this particular structure. So we just look around 
the place where you are sitting you will see a lot of furnitures, walls, the building weight itself etc. Please do understand the weight of these units are quite large. So, we just try to think over and understand ultimately where exactly these forces finally go. As I just told you in my third slide flow of forces. So, from the superstructure the load has to go to the substructure. So, where we are talking about foundations or footings because it is not seen do you think we need not worry about it? I think we all know we have to give lot of importance to that. So, that means foundations okay, are equally important to that of the superstructure because if you do not design your foundations properly irrespective of whatever kind of uh, design okay, that you have done for your superstructure. So, that cannot sustain because ultimately okay, those forces should be safely transferred onto the earth by means of this foundations. Now, look at this picture we have a person who is trying to carry some amount of weight on his head correct. So, if you just look at the flow of forces, so the weight that is carrying in his hand will pass through his body through his hands goes to the legs and finally, from the leg it will go to the soil or the ground. So, you can say something like this though in this case the feet are seen that is the part which tries to transfer the force okay, from a human being to the ground, but in this case the feet are above the ground level whereas, in case of structures it is below the ground level it is anchored firmly to the ground level. So, here you can see a lot of activities something like this we try to do and we can understand how our feet are so designed the foundations footings are so designed to try to transfer any kind of loads or movements that we make. So, that we do not lose balance or we do not do lose stability. Now, let us try to understand the purpose of providing the foundations. As I have just told you the main purpose here would be to transfer the forces from the superstructure to, to the firm soil below. So, this word is very important firm soil please do understand that you do not get good type of soil at all places. So, when you go to a particular site where you would like to construct the first thing that you need to know is what is the type of soil that we have is it good or average or poor. So, depending upon that the cost of the substructure will change. Now, I would like to give a, a simple case that is I am trying to build two structures at two different places. The first place where the soil is very good, the second place where the soil is very bad. Now, please to understand that the cost of the superstructure in both the cases would be the same whereas, the cost of the stop structure in a place where the soil is very weak can be many times more than the cost of the foundation at a place where the soil is good. So, please do understand if you have a choice okay, of the place where you can build your structure please do investigate the soil properly. So, that you have a firm soil below the structure. So, that you can easily transfer the forces onto that good soil and the amount of cost you are going to incur would be very less. Now, the second part is to see that to distribute the stresses evenly on the foundation soil such that the foundation soil neither fails nor experiences excessive settlement. There are two things that I have mentioned in this point that means, you are trying to apply pressure from the foundation to the soil such that this pressure whatever you are trying to apply 
should not fail the soil. That means each soil will have its own capacity to resist the pressure. That means if you are if you are the, the pressure that is being transmitted by the foundation to the soil is less than the capacity of the soil you can easily guess the structure is safe because the soil does not fail. Apart from that the, the, the soil should not excessively compress that means this process we call as the settlement. So, you have to design your foundation such that neither the SBC that is the, the uh, pressure exceeds the capacity of the soil nor the soil unnecessarily experiences excessive settlement. So, that is the second part and the foundations also will should anchor the structure firmly so that it, it gives you enough stability against overturning. That means as you know the structure will be subjected to lateral forces also something like the structure is being pushed okay, from the side. So, when you are standing somebody pushes you, so you know that there is every possibility that you may fall down. Okay. We call that phenomena as overturning. So, here the footing should anchor the structure such that when lateral forces act on it, it should not overturn. So, that means you should take the structure to sufficient extent and firmly anchor it. Well, it depends on the height of the building okay, and etcetera, the type of soil has to decide what to what extent we have to take this foundation below the ground level. And the final part is to provide an even surface that is level surface for smooth construction of superstructure. As you understand nowadays you try to go to the outskirts of cities to build structures and you can clearly see that the, the ground profile is not plain. Okay. It is undulated, it is sloping, but as you know the uh, price of the land is so much we would like to build our structure at any place okay, that is given to us. So, irrespective of the terrain is sloping or undulated okay, you try to prepare a level surface by trying to dig, by trying to dig the earth okay, and then build your superstructure okay, right, with the foundations over that level surface. Now, the next uh, discussion that we are trying to talk about is the type of foundations. Now, depending upon the uh, extent to which you try to take your footings below the earth, there are two different types of foundations that we talk about. One is called the shallow foundation, the second is called the deep foundation. As the names itself suggest when we say shallow the depth of the footing okay, is at a smaller distance whereas when we say deep foundations the depth is at a larger distance. Now when we say smaller or larger it is a relative term. So the IS code has quantified or even the international courts have quantified okay, the uh, shallow footings and deep foundations using this ratio. Okay. Here we have the ratio where we try to compare d f, d suffix f and b. So, here d suffix f is the depth of footing that is the bottommost uh, uh, point of the foundation with respect to the ground level that is called as the depth of the footing and width of the footing. So, each and every footing will have some physical dimension. Okay. So, we are trying to compare the physical dimension in the lateral direction. So, which we call as the width of the footing. So, if you try to take the ratio of the depth with respect to width and if this ratio is less than 1, we can call that footing as shallow footing. On the other hand, 
if the depth of the footing to width of the footing that ratio exceeds 1 or is equal to 1, we can treat that foundation as deep foundations or deep footings. So, let us try to understand what are the different types of shallow foundations that we have here. So, we will just talk about the different types of shallow foundations etcetera. So, I have a sketch here which shows you those D f and B that we have here. So, D f is the depth of the foundation as I told you it is measured from the ground level to the bottom most part of the footing. B is the width of the footing. We are talking about shallow foundation. So, we take the ratio of D f by B less than 1 we call it as shallow foundation. So, the next question that comes to your mind is ok. So, how do we fix up this depth? So, as I told you you have to transfer the forces ok coming on the structure through the foundation onto the soil. So, you have to go to sufficiently uh, uh, depths such that ok the soil is uh, good enough to resist these forces. So, that is how you try to fix up your depth of the foundation. Now, under shallow foundations there are different types of footings. The first one is the wall footing. I think all of you have seen this footing generally in the residential buildings you will see these kind of footings. So, it is one continuous footing that we have here generally made of size stone masonry. So, definitely the uh, depth of the foundation is much smaller ok you can clearly see. So, this is a popular type of footing that you all have seen. The next one is isolated footing. So, wall footings carry the load from the walls ok whereas, in case of isolated footings. So, the columns loads are transferred to the footing by means of these isolated footing. Isolated means single type of footing that means, each column will have one foundations or one footing. So, it is isolated. Next we have combined. So, that means, for two columns you, to you provide one common footing. So, we call it as combined footing you are combining two isolated footings to have one common footing called as combined footing. Then we have the strap footing. So, all these things I will explain. Then we have the strip footing something similar to wall footing, the mat or the raft footing and the grillage foundations ok. So, thus these are the different types of uh, foundations that we can categorize under shallow foundations. So, let us talk about the shallow foundations again. So, you can clearly see here this is the structure the bedrock is somewhere over there. So, we have a firm ground here. So, you can easily transfer the forces onto the firm ground and the ground will easily transfer to the bed of rock that we have here. So, something like this the structure is built on some kind of slabs over there and this okay, can easily transfer the forces to the ground and the ground in turn will go transfer it to the bed rock. So, you can understand that shallow foundations are present mostly on firm soils or where the loads are very small on the structure. So, this is a typical picture ok where we have lot of uh, isolated footings ok in a construction site ok. Now, coming to the first type of foundation that is isolated or spread footing ok. So, this is the plan of the footing and this is the elevation of the footing. So, in plan you can clearly see two uh, 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 squares or two rectangles that we have here. So, this is nothing but the column and that is nothing but the area or dimension of the footing seen from the top. So, from the side so that is the column below that you have the slab. So, this type of footing we call as isolated or spread footing ok. So, here you need to understand that each column will have an independent footing. Now, you try to provide such kind of isolated 
uh, foundations or footings for columns when the SBC that is the safe bearing capacity of the soil is generally high that means the pressure it can resist is quite high than when compared to the pressure that the foundation is trying to transfer okay, onto the soil okay. and when the columns are far apart again this can be recommended and the loads on footings are less okay the the amount of force that is p that is acting on the foundations are less so under any of these contexts you can choose isolated or spread footings now you need to understand that this is the most economical type of footing that you can think of when compared to other types so given a choice it is always wise to go for isolated or spread foundations. Now coming to the plan shapes that is shapes of these foundations okay, when seen from the top. Now generally we say that the shape of the uh, footing depends on the shape of the column cross section. Now here we have a isolated square footing. Now just try to see this, this is nothing but the cross section of the column and that is nothing but the cross section of the footing. So what you need to understand is we generally match the shape of the footing with the shape of the cross with the shape of the column. So in this case this is called as the square footing. We can also have a rectangular footing. So that means the column is rectangular in shape. So we also try to make the shape of the footing also as rectangular. Next we have circular footings. So here the shape of the column is circular. So we can also try to give a circular shape to the footings. Now I hope you will see that in a structure columns will be of various shapes and sizes. You need to understand that generally okay, one dimension of the column okay, is kept standard that means we also say it is 9 inches or 230 millimeters so that you match that with the thickness of the wall. So when you build a wall okay, the column gets flushed inside the wall so you will not see where the column is and uh, aesthetically it looks nice. We do not want columns to protrude out of the walls. So generally if the size of the column can be confined to 230 by 230, 9 inches by 9 inches, you stick to a, a square column. Now when the forces are more, it is not possible for you to have a square shaped column of size being 9 inches. So we have to increase the size. So we do not take a column of 1 feet by 1 feet that is 300 by 300 because it will be seen okay, when you build it. Okay, the walls do not try to cover these columns. So we try to keep one dimension of the column okay, constant okay, and try to adjust this length so that you have sufficient area for column okay, to transfer okay, the forces. So if your column shape is rectangular, the footing shape will also be rectangular. Now coming to the last one, circular. This is most aesthetically uh, pleasing type of column you can think of especially in case of community halls okay, or in case of uh, uh, chow trees okay, like dining rooms or in offices where columns are cannot be uh, confined within the wall it will be exposed. So the best choice would be circular columns because it looks quite pleasing nice we do not have any edges over there. So for such kind of columns definitely you can think of having circular footings. It is not a must but you can have circular footings. You can also have a square footing for a circular column. Now when you just talk about the spread footings, so these spread footings as I told you will have a, a slab at the bottom of the column. Correct? Now these uh, slabs at the bottom can have different shapes, okay? elevation. When you look from the side elevation you can have different types of elevations like here it is a flat type of a slab that is a slab is 
flat rectangular. This is the most popular type of uh, uh, spread footing or isolated footing that we have. Apart from that, you can have a stepped footing something like this. So, this is to have some amount of economy. So, as you understand, so at edges, okay, it is not necessary to have more area over there. So, whenever it is possible to uh, reduce some amount of concrete, so it is definitely possible to have an arrangement like this. So, we call such type of footings as stepped footings. Now, coming to the third one, okay, it is called the sloped footing. So, definitely this is better. Okay, you can clearly see that is again instead of trying to compare with uh, 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 first one that is slab. So, the second and third are much better with respect to saving in material. So, you can try to design your slabs in any of these shapes okay, depending upon okay, how exactly or how economically you can try to design your structure. Now, the, if you just look at a typical uh, type of reinforcements that we have at the site. So, you can clearly see that this is a picture showing a ground which is excavated and we have put some reinforcements at the bottom of this particular pit. If you look at this picture carefully, so we have bars running okay, in this direction okay, as well as perpendicular to that. It means it is put in two orthogonal directions okay, and then it is slightly bent upwards at the edges. So, this is the main reinforcements that we have in case of an isolated footing. So, above this you can clearly see some vertical rods okay, ending up in this footing on this mat footing. Now, why are we trying to provide these reinforcements in the foundation? The first one is to resist the bending moment that would be there in the slabs and the second one to resist the shear forces. So, just like your beam, the footings will also have bending moments and shear force. But the most important thing that you need to understand here is generally we do not provide, generally we do not provide, remember okay, shear stirrups in case of footings whereas, we always provide that in case of beams. So, what we do is we try to give sufficient depth okay, for the slabs, so that whatever shear forces okay, that would be acting would be resisted by the combination of the depth and the percentage of steel that we would be trying to put in the slab foundations. So, these reinforcements are there to resist the bending moment and the shear forces. These are some pictures okay, in sites showing the different activities okay, in case of uh, 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 footings in a building. So, some kind of activities you can clearly see that machineries are a must when the amount of excavation is large okay, and uh, repetitive all those things okay, you have need to understand. So, various stages of activities like they have been just dug you have put the reinforcements. So, here some sort of reinforced concrete has been placed. So, you can clearly see the foundations are almost over and this is again another part of construction activity etcetera. Now, let us try to move on to the next type of footing that is combined footing. So, as you can clearly see in that picture, you have two columns one beside the other and if you look at the slab. So, you have one single or common slab for both the columns. So, this is nothing this is called the combined footings. So, you have okay, a, a common slab okay, for two or more columns. Now, when do we try to provide such kind of footings? So, we try to provide such kind of footings when the SBC is generally less when compared to the previous case and the columns are closely spaced okay, and footings are heavily loaded. So, under these situations what you will understand is if you try to calculate the area of the individual spread footings for each and every column assume that there is some load on this column, there is some load on this column 
to resist that load and moment. If I try to design this particular foundation for that load and for this load and if you try to map the areas of these foundations, okay, please do not just overlap. Okay. So, under such situations we always try to connect the two slabs as one single slab. So, you can understand that these type of uh, footings are generally present when the species is generally less, the columns are closely spaced and the footings are heavily loaded. So, generally these uh, foundations are rectangular in plan. So, you can clearly see, so that is a rectangular kind of combined footing. So, this is the plan that is the elevation. So, we have one column here, one column here, look at the spacings, okay, dimensions, it is not generally symmetric. That means, the center of the slab does not coincide with respect to the center of the columns. Okay. Generally, that will not happen. So, that is the elevation. Okay. We just see from the side, this is how it looks. So, we have one slab connecting the two columns. Apart from that, you can also have a beam and a slab type of an arrangement. This is very similar to the beam and slab in case of floor slabs. In case of floor slabs, generally the slabs are at the top, the, the beams are at the bottom, whereas here the situation is the reverse. That means, the slabs are at the bottom, the beams protrude above. So, you can clearly see this as seen from the plan. So, that is a slab and these two parallel lines that you are trying to see is nothing but the two ends of the beam which is seen from the top and which is above the slab base. That means, so you can clearly see this is the beam part that we have here and that is a slab part that we have here. So, even you can have a slab and a beam kind of an arrangement. So, either you can have a common slab, only one slab or you have a slab and a beam type of an arrangement. Now, combined footings are also seen okay, in cases where you try to build a column just at the adjacent of the boundary line. Now, look at this, assume that that is a boundary line. So, this is our property. So, I would like to build a column like this. So, if I try to build a column and try to design it as a isolated spread footing, so you can easily understand that my footing would be of this shape. So, this part of the foundation will go to the adjacent property and definitely we cannot do such a kind of a construction. So, you cannot build your a footing okay, to uh, which will extend to the neighboring boundary. So, what we have to do is we have to see to it that okay, this is okay, confined to our boundary. So, I cannot just try to trim off this particular part and try to have a footing like this. Generally, it is not possible especially when the loads are very large. So, what we do is we try to connect this exterior column with an interior column Okay, and we try to combine these two uh, columns by a single footing which we call as the combined footing. So, here this uh, combined footing can have a rectangular plan as shown like this or it can have a trapezoidal plan as seen in this particular slide. Okay. So, these are some more pictures of rectangular footings again. So, you can clearly see this is has to be uh, a, a combined footing on the boundary. So, you can clearly see this column has almost come to the edge of the footing. So, I cannot take any part of the footing beyond this. So, this has to be a property line. So, again the same thing is here a property line. So, this shape is rectangle, this shape is trapezoidal. So, this is one uh, footing okay, that has been done at the site. You can clearly see. So, you have a jungle of reinforcements here that is nothing but the column bars. Again, you have reinforcements of another column bar. The two has been joined in case of combined footing. So, apart from this combined footing, we also have a strap footing. So, in case of a strap footing, okay, you have two isolated footings okay, which would be connected by means of a beam which we call as a strap beam. Again, this kind of arrangement would be generally seen in case of footings located close to property line. Similar to combined footing, this is an alternate way of trying to do the same 
kind of job that we did in the previous slide. Correct. So, what we do? We try to have independent slabs below the columns of the two footings and then try to connect these two columns by a strap beam. So, this takes a lot of forces, okay. this transfers a lot of forces from the two columns and hence okay, you can just try to balance your foundation, so that okay, it tries to uh, uh, I mean uh, transfer the force safely. One important point that you need to understand in strap footing is okay, the beam does not transfer any force to the soil. So, anyway if you just try to recollect, so I have just tried to give you a small background of various types of footings. Okay. I have a still uh, uh, two or three more uh, types of uh, shallow foundations, different types of shallow foundations that I would be trying to speak to you in the uh, next class and uh, once we do that we will go to deep foundations etcetera and we will try to continue the discussions. Anyway I hope that you have tried to uh, go through this uh, exercise okay, and you have understood all these basics which are very relevant to understand the problems of design of footings. Thank you.